so <laughs> Every actor should be so lucky to do so little and get such a <laughs> big um, Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for giving up um, some of your Sunday to come to hear about the 2023 season and also our plans for the redevelopment next year. Um, my name is Declan, I'm the Artistic Director of Griffin Theatre Company and before we start I just want to acknowledge that we're gathering here today on unceded Gadigal land. Um, I want to offer respect to elders past and present and also I guess sort of situate ourselves um, here uh, at uh, the SBW Stables which is a site of storytelling within a much much longer tradition of storytelling that spans tens of thousands of years and recognize the privilege it is for us to get to sto tell stories alongside this. Um, this is a little bit of a different thing for us. We haven't I, th I think at least in my memory done a kind of subscriber briefing before, um, but we wanted to kind of give it a crack this year um, for a couple of reasons. One of them, I guess, is that coming into this job myself as artistic director um, from uh, working inside other theatre companies around Australia, it really struck me how incredible it is to have um, the kind of subscriber support we do have at Griffin because when every other theatre company in Australia launches a season it's full of names that are super familiar to audiences like names like Shakespeare and <laughs> Ibsen and um, somebody who wrote a play that went on on Broadway five years ago or whatever and and that's not the experience of Griffin's subscribers. People subscribe to Griffin just out of <coughs> trust and curiosity and accept the risk that we all take when we come to see new writing. Um, these are a bunch of writers who you've often never heard of, a bunch of actors who <coughs> might be taking their first major steps as seriously talented people in the um, main stage or kind of professional stage. And um, there's risk in that. And it's something that we don't really don't take for granted. Um, it's a huge amount of trust that gets kind of invested in us by Griffin subscribers. So I guess this year we wanted to just let you know a little bit more about what you're going to come and see <laughs> this year. And um, I guess, yeah, try and feed your curiosity um, uh, a little bit more and say thank you in a way. Um, there's also a really major thing happening over um, 2024 and 2025, which is the first kind of really, really major redevelopment of this um, beautiful and iconic space which is so important to Australian theatre history and um, we wanted you to be amongst some of the kind of first um, humans, the people who are really the better at this company to hear about what some of those early plans are. Um, so uh, basically the way this is going to work is I'm going to just invite up a bunch of different artists who are presenting work in the season. I'm going to ask them a bunch of questions about their show, about why they wrote it um, uh, and uh, then I'm going to give an opportunity for all of you to ask any questions if you want to, so start percolating mm. on that as you're kind of listening as we're going through. And then finally, Julianne Campbell, our executive director, is going to come up and show you some of the like really early architectural plans for the building. Um, so you can uh, yeah, get that kind of uh, first look in, first preview. Um, so I'm not going to go on too much about the 2023 season at this point, I think a lot of the people in this room have probably like looked at the program or um, uh, the brochure and read about it but basically the kind of fundamental principle behind what we programmed for this year has been um, the idea that we're going to be out of here for two years um, and we really want to spend 2023 showcasing everything incredible that, and transformative and surprising that this beautiful theatre is capable of against so many kind of expectations. Um, so uh, I think the first show of the year um, uh, is one that we're really going to be pushing the limits of what we can kind of mm -hmm. achieve in mm -hmm. this space. <laughs> um, and I'll just talk about it with me a little bit. I'm going to introduce the playwright and co-director of the work alongside myself. Um, the play is Sex Magic and uh, I'd love to introduce you to Nicholas Brown. <laughs> This is such a weird thing. We just did one of these, so, so, so these sessions um, at one o'clock as well, and it's this weird thing where like we've been working together for two years on this project, and I'm asking you all these questions that I already know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so please just like tolerate that. Like, <laughs> this is a real suspension of disbelief. Um, but Nick, uh, could you tell us uh, really quickly just about the story of Sex Magic? What happens in the play? Yeah, sure. Um, Sex Magic is. Uh, a story about uh, a young Aussie Indian guy called Ard Panika, who goes on a uh, sexual and spiritual 
journey in order to um, decolonize um, the Western views on sex and gender that he um, was taught um, that inhibited him for so many years, basically. Um, it is an interesting story in that the structure of it is uh, inspired by uh, the structure of a Katakali play. Katakali is the way to pronounce it. I keep telling myself I should do the proper pronunciation. Um, the Katakali is an ancient South Indian um, theatre and dance form, and it's uh, there, it's told through the emotions of um, nine facial expressions. And so the structure of this story is actually told through nine, um, the nine facial expressions of Katakali. So we're really sort of messing with um, the genre in a way as well. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a story about uh, a sexual awakening of a, of, a, of a young Aussie Indian guy, basically. And in the play, um, the main character, Art, starts experiencing seizures or kind of like facial seizures that um, he can't be explained by Western medicine. So he goes to South India, um, Kerala, where um, he kind of ends up finding all these different answers that unlock different blockages and parts of himself. Um, I'd love it if you could talk to people a little bit about the parallels kind of with your own journey writing this play, like what motivated you to write it? Because you've been working on it for a very long time, right? I have, yeah. When I started writing this, it was a, it was uh, initially a film. Um, and that was like ten years ago. About ten years ago, yeah. And I was living in Mumbai at the time. I'm 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 from Sydney, but I moved to India, and I was working in Bollywood, playing these uh, kind of masculine um, <laughs> villains <Yeah>. over there. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> why are you doing <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why. Maybe it's my pointy nose, <laughs> pointy chin. I don't know. Um, but uh, I just worked out um, that I was queer and then moved to a country <laughs> where it was illegal to be gay. And suddenly I was playing these masculine, you know, um, toxic, these toxic kind of male roles. And um, uh, I actually turned to Indian mythology and Hinduism and really found understanding, solace, healing, yeah, and uh, in, in Hindu mythology. Um, and found Hindu mythology to be extremely queer and found that a lot of the gods and goddesses and deities would change sex and uh, I found it to be very explicit and sexual which is the opposite of what I grew up with because my mother um, is very Catholic and so I was fascinated by this, this, this world um, of this, the history of um, Hinduism I suppose and the mythology behind it and um, I, I just couldn't quite understand why uh, India was so conservative and then obviously it was because of the British that lived there for hundreds of years and being Anglo-Indian myself um, I felt that there must be some kind of story within this that I can tell that extracts from both worlds um, and yeah, that, was, yeah. that was the genesis of the story. Like it must have been a pretty interesting tension going um, uh, I guess learning all this stuff about the foundations of the Hindu religion which is like you know, thousands and thousands of years old. Um, these texts like the Ramayana, like you say, where there are these kind of stories of deities changing gender and having sex with people of the same sex, etc. And then working in a bol in Bollywood, like in an industry where you can't like kiss yeah. in films, like there's this extreme sexual repression that, but from a culture that is was it, it's bound in years, like so sexually liberated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when I was living when I was living over there, that there was a. a a moral police that would go around and men and women were, you know, at this time, 10 years ago, were not allowed to hold hands in public, but then all the men would walk around holding hands. And I thought, oh my God, everyone's gay, this is so strange. But of course they they were not. But just gender and sexuality is so different over there, I think because of the, the mythology and these ancient texts and everyone grows up knowing about them. And, um, yeah, I wanted to, to create a story uh, that uh, incorporated all of that. And, um, and it, like you're, you're wanting to have a really kind of com complex conversation with the audience about sexuality and gender um, and culture in this play. For you as a playwright, um, let's say this is like mid-season, the general public audience in, or maybe some of the people in this room in, um, and you're down in the foyer afterwards. What do you hope you you mm -hmm. hear people talking about? <laughs> What's the topic on people's lips? Yeah, I mean, well, it's a, I guess it's a psychosexual drama. Um, you want people saying that? God, how sick is it? It's an erotic, uh, erotic 
psychosexual thriller, perhaps. Um, I, I, I mean, I hope that people are aroused by it. I hope that people... Um, <laughs> I don't think we hear that enough in theatre. I know. <laughs> I hope that they, they learn a little bit about Tantra and Tantric sex. Um, I hope that audiences uh, question the origins of their wellness practices. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, explain. I, I, I lived in America um, after I was in India and more people said namaste to me in America than they ever did to me in, um, in India. <laughs> so the, the hypocrisy of, uh, of, of um, the wellness industry and uh, how quickly people will, uh, will try and uh, sell a spiritual practice and how it will be received by the Western world, I find fascinating and we explore that in, in sex magic as well. Um, so I hope people question yeah, the origins of of their, their practices, because so many of us um, you know, practice yoga and meditation, um, perhaps don't really know where it comes from or who the person is that's teaching it to us. Um, I, hope people, I also hope that people really question, or yeah, question themselves, how the decisions that they've made, um, question their sexuality, perhaps, their, their gender even. I feel that, um, uh, yeah, this play is very much, uh, it's not a coming out story, it, it's, it, it, cracks, it cracks open the idea of gender and sexuality and I hope uh, yeah, the audiences really ask themselves these deep questions, mm -hmm. yeah, who am I and who taught me who I, wa who I was, you know, uh, who taught me that? Um, was it taught by the church, was it taught by religion, was it taught, you know, by, by a male in power that we just question all those things? What is this construct that has been created around us? Um, yeah. And if I was to smash all of that, would I be living the same life that I am now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some big <No>. questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to give you a little kind of preview into um, into uh, the design of the show. And to do this, I might, I don't think I actually asked you if I could get myself in, so I don't mind if we do this But um, I'm going to introduce you to Solomon Thomas, who is the video designer on um, Sex Magic, who is also going to be talking to you about another show that's doing this season as well. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, so as part of designing Sex Magic, the, the, it's been designed at the moment, it's going to be it's on the first show of the year. Um, we, uh, we did a kind of like unorthodox thing as part of the process where we had um, the design process, I guess, in some way facilitated by AI. Yes. Um, do you want to, which was very much led by yourself. And we've got some images to show you. Do you want to talk about how we did that? Yeah. Um, so we went away for two a, a night. Uh, as the designers, lighting, set, and video, and that was really helpful to just be in a room and just talking over dinner, keep talking, keep going, wake up in the morning, keep talking, um, and that was helpful. Um, I've been using AI a lot since it started coming out to the public uh, recently, just to help as a visualization. Like it's um, it's really easy to type something in and get an image up. Usually, it used to take you know, ages, someone would have to paint it or draw it or something like that. So as we were talking, I was typing what we were talking <laughs> into these AIs that um, I subscribe to. You actually have to be a subscriber to AI. So I subscribe to these AIs and they give you back pictures of words that you're saying and stuff. And as we were doing that, we could, oh, here's some of them. So um, we were talking about the, the show being set in a locker room with like ferns coming in and I just typed in, Lock, steamy locker room with ferns <laughs> and it comes up with these beautiful images that we can start to uh, it doesn't come up with this straight away we kind of pick yeah. oh, that one's nice the green is nice let's kind of play on that but um and then I started typing in descriptions <coughs> that Nick had written into the play of like scenes um, and it started coming up with these beautiful katakali dances like made out of smoke and um, uh, a young boy and an old his cat father. and his, his father um, and, and we keep playing with these ideas of smoke and steam and um, these kind of things and this is what the AI comes up with when you start doing that and not to we're not going to put this on stage but more as for designers a start to kind of like talk to each other oh I like that blue and then someone could be like I like that blue too and you start to talk like that so it's not so much that these will be the images on the stage, but rather 
these are really like, it's just a really powerful tool to start muse. as a group. Yeah, muse yes. on each other. Um, and I'm not a painter. Um, I studied as acting. <laughs> and so for video design, I don't have many skills when it comes to like drawing or painting. It's all computer, it's all digital stuff. And so this for me is really helpful in terms of like uh, imagining, but also just referencing like, oh, uh, we used to like, a couple of months ago, just go on the internet and type in the things you want to do and show each other pictures on Pinterest or Google Images. But this tool now like allows us to kind of really kind of fall into the world a bit more and be enveloped by these worlds. And like you can input images in there and then Steam comes out of that image just by typing in Steam. And so that was really helpful for us um, just to come together as a design. And it really helped with um, because Mason was so good, who's the designing the set and costumes, I was very good at like being very quick to being like, I think it should be set here. These are my design principles. This is what I think the space, how the space works, how it should work. And then I could kind of like be putting that in and he could be like, yes, exactly like that. And we could keep moving, like these references yeah. could and come a lot quicker. Yeah. And one thing is like, we are now literally setting the play in the locker room overgrown by ferns. So yes. when you come and see the play, that is exactly what you're going to see. Because we can see that in the image and go, actually, that's really cool. We should, yeah. We should do that. So the designer had no intent of using a locker room initially. No, no, no. Uh, we, more, Mason said, oh, oh, what about a locker room with ferns? And I could oh, type that in and we could oh, see it. And we were like, that's really cool. Let's, let's do that. So the AI wasn't kind of saying to us, these are the things you could do. It was more like we were saying to the AI, could you show us what this looked like? Could you show us? There were other ideas we had that have not come out and did not get fulfilled and weird images that don't really make much sense to the play. But as you start to um, siphon through this, it just can, it's a way of talking back. It's like when you have an actor on stage suddenly doing lines, you can really see what the show can be. With design, it's a bit harder to, so to be able to see space and image coming out of the play so quickly is a really helpful tool and quite beautiful as well. Yeah. I mean, if we could put that on stage, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so we have our computer overlords in helping us make better theatre <laughs> in addition to everything else. Yes. Um, thank you so much. That's all right. Do you want to stick around? I because do. Because you're going to talk about your own show as yes. well. Um, <laughs> yes. One second. Uh, Computers can't do stage programs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to move on and talk about the second show of the season. Um, uh, uh, it is a work by um, Eloise Snape, uh, performed by Brielle Clark, directed by Anthony Williams. It is called Pony, and we are very lucky to have Eloise joining us here today. <laughs> Um, Eloise, do you want to tell us a little bit about the story of Pony? What happens in Pony? Sure, what happens in Pony? Pony is a one-woman show um, about a, a woman who is in her late 30s and on the precipice of becoming a mother, um, unexpectedly, and uh, I guess it's sort of like a, a coming of middle age story in there. <laughs> um, how does uh, someone who has been, I guess, entirely consumed by her own um, life and <laughs> being able to do everything the way she wants to do it, come to terms with the fact she's now going to have to uh, potentially live for somebody else? Um, and uh, I guess through that, I, I'm trying to explore all ideas of um, you know, family connections, lost connections, motherhood, um, physically, what happens uh, to someone when they go through a pregnancy. Um, the story's told through um, the nine months of her pregnancy. Um, and it's, it's, it's a comedy, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. I hope so too. I hope so too. Yeah, no, yeah. It's very funny. Um, you, uh, this, this story kind of also, I guess, similarly to with Sex Magic and Nick has quite a few parallels to your own life. I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about where, yeah. why you started writing Pony and how it aligns with yeah, your own story. Um, I started writing it when I, I think I, I was, I completely lost my mind a little bit in the, yeah, when I, when my daughter was a newborn. Um, and it was, uh, really the beginning of the, the pandemic. So. I think having um, ha having a child going through that experience of, of pregnancy and giving birth 
uh, during this, you know, period of time is actually like quite a unique experience as, as well as it being something that many people <laughs> have also done. So I think that really fascinated me as well as I, I felt so completely overwhelmed by the entire experience that I was like, hang on, this is happening like, like people are, like there are babies being born <laughs> every day and I, I'm finding this like, yeah, completely overwhelming. Why don't we talk about it more? And I, 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 um, I think as well in my uh, sleep deprivation, I sort of uh, <laughs> found a, um, a way of kind of uh, getting through through those those early months, and it was by by writing this play. I I also felt cause I I had I was diagnosed with with postnatal depression and anxiety that that came on very quickly for me, and and um, actually luckily it kind of disappeared quickly as well. Um, but I I think I really tried to present to to everybody around me and in, in my world that I was I had it together. I was I was. Um, doing very well, <laughs> that I was nailing this motherhood thing, I was nailing doing it during COVID, that everything was okay. And, I, and then it got to the point where I was like, why am I, why am I like not actually talking about the, the truth of how this has made me feel, <laughs> you know? Why, why do we feel like we have to nail everything all the time as human beings? Why can't we actually just say, I am failing miserably at this and this is really hard? <laughs> it's interesting yeah. because the, um, the, I mean, one of the things that's so, like, uh, feels so true about Pony is the experience of this kind of young woman, she's in her kind of mid thirties. She's like, as you say, living for herself. Her life is this kind of whirlwind of like going to hen's nights and <laughs> being entertained by male strippers of varying quality. And, um, <laughs> and so, like having this really kind of wild life and then unexpected pregnancy, biological clock starts going, yeah, I'm going to start, um, I'm going to become a mother. Mm -hmm. And then it feels like what she struggles with in the play is the expectations around what a mother should look like, act like while she's Pregnant. There's an amazing scene at the wine glass, the wine scene, I love. Oh, yeah, yeah, because that actually, I mean, like, <laughs> funnily enough, a lot of it was actually what happened. Right, right. But, but yeah, that scene, yeah, it was, you know, without giving too much away, where I, I had a, I kind of had a panic attack when my, um, my beautiful husband and I were on our, our baby moon, so, you know, we went away together, and it was actually, like, still during, I mean, I, th I think maybe it was, like, as, things had opened up but we kind of like snuck away to the southern highlands and we hid away in this cottage and we went to this beautiful so restaurants must have been open so we went to this beautiful restaurant and I I'd said to myself I'm, I'm going to have I'm going to have a champagne like I'm just going to have this one champagne and I think I was 32 weeks pregnant or and you know I had decided that that would be an okay thing to do, but I immediately, like, and I think I was probably creating the situation, I immediately felt like every single eye in that room was on me as I was, like, picking, like, going towards, and I was like, this is horrible. It's my body. It's my decision. It's why do I feel, and no one was, and I don't think anyone was thinking, well, no one cared, like, no one was looking at me. Like, no, no, one, no one gives a shit about you. Like, and, and I think that, yeah, it was like, I was overwhelmed by that, that I was like, that, uh, yeah, is something that I had, and it turned into this real panicky moment, this, this beautiful romantic dinner, and it was supposed to be turned into like a panic attack, <laughs> which <laughs> is quite funny, play. which turned into a play, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, awesome, um, and what, what about this made you want to write it as a one woman show, sort of like a drama with heaps of different actors coming and going? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, I think someone described it to me once as what I've written is that it was afterwards they were like, you've written. And I was like, thank you for telling me what I've written. A poly mono monologue? A poly monodrama. A poly monodrama. Okay. Yeah, I know, right? I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know what that is either. But it's a, <laughs> um, some, yeah, uh, which is like a, a one, I guess a one person show that must go between yeah, comedy and, and drama. I think, I think I should probably look it up. Um, but it's, uh, I think it was because really I felt like this is, for me, um, I mean it's a very personal story, but it is so about the, the physical changes that are occurring in the one person's body and mind that I felt like it needed to be told through one and one person, like it's just a female voice. Yeah. And that is what it needs to be. And also, what a wonderful challenge to create, like I think I've written up to 30 different characters that 
yeah. um, Brielle and has to play. And I thought how, I mean, that is so, so entertaining for an audience to watch an actor have to master something like that. Totally, especially someone of Brielle's colour oh, as well. Like, she's, she's amazing. Such an actress, so mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I, I think that's more entertaining than having thirty different people come on to be like Doctor One and, and yeah. like. Yeah, we also don't so, have the space. Yeah, don't <laughs> 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 you've seen the dressing room. I'll build her room later. Um, thank you so much, Eloise. Um, I'm sure people will have questions thank for you when we open it up. Awesome. Um, so the third one takes a wild turn um, in the season. We are kind of opening with these two kind of very raucous comedies, and then we move into a new work by the legendary um, Susie Miller, um, a play called Jail Baby. Um, she's been sort of desperate to write for a while. Um, we undertook a work script workshop on Jail Baby last week. Um, unfortunately, Susie couldn't be here. As you can imagine, she's pretty much the busiest woman in the world <laughs> right now. She's, after having Prima Facie on the West End, it's just been announced for Broadway as well, um, for a new production, which is incredible to think that this was a play that started in this theater we're sitting in right now. Um, but um, Susie uh, wanted to record a video message. Hi, I'm Susie Miller. I'm the writer of Jail Baby and we're developing it today in the studio, which is really exciting. I'm so excited to be back at my home at Griffin and the intimate theatre here and also the people that really support Griffin and the people that live around the area. Really excited about Australian theatre. It's wonderful to be home. Jail Baby is a passion project for me. It really reflects on another thing about the legal system that I'm very passionately outraged and confused by. And it, Griffin couldn't be a better home for it. So the main character is a guy called AJ, who's very young and gets himself meddled up in a criminal situation, goes to prison. And then what happens is like a runaway train, basically. And it's very representational and very real for me because I worked closely with people who were like AJ for many, many years when I was a lawyer. Yeah, I wrestle in this work really with the way the law only protects property more than anything else. And in fact, the law was invented as a way of protecting property, not people. And I think the leftover of that is that that's still the priority of the legal system. This is a very different work to my previous plays. It probably is closer in its style or its way of getting to the grit of something than my very first play, Cross Sections, which was based in King's Cross, just around the corner from Griffin. This one is going back to a very strong ideological base for me, but also very much about character. Something similar about Prima Facie and Jail Baby, but not what you think. The similarities are that I'm looking in at the legal system and prizing it apart and showing where its inconsistencies lay. I think through this work, people are going to question a whole lot of ideals around how we vote and what we vote for and what we're outraged about and what we have actually let slipped by in the, in the legal system. Uh, or Griffin audiences are super special because they're super smart. <laughs> they really understand theatre. They're a really gifted audience for people who are putting a new play up which is all of us, mainly at Griffin. What's exciting for me is coming back from London from big theatres and coming back to Griffin, which is small but exquisite, that has that intimacy and that po uh, power around story to really draw you in. And I think I'm so thrilled that this is premiering at Griffin. And just as a guest, a rejoiner for, um, from what Susie was saying, it's also like, it's so exciting to us to have a writer like Susie, who's, who has been so held by this space and its audiences throughout her career, to be coming back here again. But also because she's not, like, Susie is a major international playwright. Um, but I still think that this is a dangerous story. And it's a dangerous story that not many theatre companies who are bigger, who have much larger theatres to fill, would take a gamble mm -hmm. on at this point. Um, it's She wants to have a social conversation about the sexual abuse and rape of young men in prisons, which is something that we all know socially is happening. Susie, um, I'm the dramaturg of the work, so I was in this development. Susie told us a story about being in court um, with a judge who was sentencing a young man and said to him that um, once he is in jail, there are a lot of men in there who will want to get to know him very well and who have faces that only a mother could love. And the idea that this is like articulated directly in a court of law against a young man that this form of like punishment and torture is occurring socially in a way that we all know about but isn't actually being um, spoken about publicly aside from like jokes, yeah. really. 
Um, uh, Susie is absolutely as somebody who knows this world so well as a former um, a lawyer, uh, the person to be telling this story and telling it on this stage. So we're also hugely grateful to Susie that she's coming back here to do this, um, but also grateful that this is the space where it will be supported in the way it needs to be supported in front of, as she said, a kind of smart, engaged audience. Um, I'm just going to leave that there because it's big and heavy and it's a <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> um, and talk about the final show in the season, which is um, uh, Black Show Girls, directed by um, uh, Shari Sevens, written by Nakia Louie. Unfortunately, Shari is shooting a film at the moment, um, which is uh, part of why we moved the show from 22 to um, uh, 2023. Um, I won't talk about it too much because most of you um, will know about this show already, but it is Nakia Louie, one of Australia's most brilliant satirists, a, to a Torres Strait Islander and Google Roy woman, um, writing a kind of refit of one of the worst films ever made, um, mm -hmm. Paul Verhoeven's Showgirls, um, to make a kind of big and spectacular and ridiculous um, commentary about, um, about uh, industry and commerce in the First Nations art world. Mm -hmm. um, it's really funny, it's totally ridiculous. I said that we were gonna try and really test the limits of the space, um, with the shows and this will probably be the final show in the staples in its current form and it's like a full burlesque casino First Nations 4 show crammed on the stage. There will be like high kicks this far away from the front row if you want an advance. And I was thinking of something I could tell everybody that you wouldn't know otherwise if you haven't come to this about the show and I thought I'd give you a little like preview about um, Shari's premise for the show. So what she's um, interested in doing is having um, people can buy Black Show Girls dollars from the bar before the show, which will be um, so you get like notes in your hand when you come in to see it, and uh, the proceeds of that will go towards um, a First Nations um, uh, kind of not-for-profit organisation like Black Rainbow or something like that. And basically during the show, when they do kind of like floor spectacular shows, the audience can make it rain. Tip the performance of each show, which is really, really fun. Um, unless there's another COVID wave, in which case, um, <laughs> a little bit too interactive. Um, so that would be Black Show Girls, and uh, that's our main season, effectively. Um, the other thing that will be happening here next year will be our lookout season, which hopefully many of you have seen our lookout, lookout shows. These are works that are not made by Griffin, but we host them and we seed them. Um, it's a season of work, um, two shows a year, that's about supporting the next generation of exceptional Sydney theatre makers, the people who will be sitting in these chairs and in the season in years to come. It's an opportunity to kind of experience them before they take off. Um, so hopefully you would have seen Jarley by Oliver Twist, um, A's for Apple by um, uh, Jess Bellamy or Mother May We by Mel Ree, which happened this year. We have two lookout works happening next year. One of them is Gadigal Gal by Graham Sims, which we're really excited about, at least partially because um, the idea of an early career artist or a, um, with someone like Graham is really different. He's not a recent NIDA graduate. Graham, for those of you who know him, has been making work on stages in Sydney, drag clubs and community centres and more for um, decades at this point. Um, and Graham, or Nana Miss Koori, his uh, <laughs> alter ego, um, will be making his stage debut here at the SBW Stables in a one-person um, show about his phenomenal life, everything he has endured as a, um, and thrived through as a um, as a, a gaggle man and as a queer man and as a drag queen in Australia. Um, and then the other work we have Solomon with his other hat on uh, here to talk to us about Solomon Thomas, um, who is presenting UFO, um, uh, a collaboration between himself and Kirby Medway and Brie Group Performance Collective. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about UFO? And what happens yes. Well? Um, so UFO is a show that Kirby and I have been making for the last seven or so years. Um, uh, it's about a UFO that lands in a rural Australian town and what happens afterwards. Um, the way it's staged is kind of uh, in miniature. I've, I've created this, it's, I've created the technology. I've used 3D printing and stuff to scan the actors, turn them into models in a little 3D rendering um, program and uh, puppet models and then reprint them so that they're articulatable and then they articulate themselves as little puppets on a miniature golf course in front of you uh, and we use cameras to create like a stop motion film 
um, in miniature in front of you and the actors perform what is kind of like a radio play really, um, harking back to, oh my god, I've forgotten the name, War of the Worlds, yes. those kind of ones. Um, and yeah, these are the little, that's James with his little James, and they're the little, this is at Marigong, um, part of their season. And so yeah, there's a little miniature set which I've built um, uh, in a little doll's house that I bought from Etsy, <laughs> which we're upgrading for this season. But um, yeah, so it's, a, it's basically a film and a stage show performed through miniature. And it's about um, big things coming into small people's lives. It's about being an individual in this world and facing larger than yourself things. Um, we were kind of writing it and creating it uh, ages ago when the fires were happening in New South Wales and it seems like the perfect time to write a show about something so big that you kind of can't comprehend it, you can't feel like a person in front of it. I was really interested in the idea that none of us are superheroes, none of us can do anything, we're just stuck figuring out how far the fire is away from you know, your parents' property and those kind of things and just counting the numbers and the days and the amount of smoke that's in Sydney. And that's all you can do. And that's what you feel you can do. And so that's what this was kind of about, is peep three or four people um, are just there when this UFO lands and they have to count how many times it flashes. Um, and then we've kept developing it and it happens and COVID happened and it felt even more um, interesting. We just keep counting and this big thing looms over us and we don't know what to do about it. So. Um, Kirby's really interested in sci-fi, I mean, uh, the show came about, we were listening to War of the Worlds under his house the, on a record player one day, and I was like, oh, let's do a sci-fi show, and um, I wanted to have a real UFO land in a real paddock, because we're both country Australia boys, but that doesn't work in theatres, <laughs> <laughs> unless you all want to come out to a paddock. Um, so we've made it miniature, and that's kind of part of my, I'm a, uh, theatre maker, but also a video designer, and I like meddling with technology, as you saw before. And so I've also created the video design and done all the printing and painting and stuff for the show. So yeah. I was going to ask, I'm going to ask all one question, and I'm going to turn out to all of you for any questions you might have for any of the artists on stage before we hear about the new version of the stables. Um, uh, so there's been like heaps of live cinema theatre stuff happening yes. on stages in Sydney, things like Dorian Gray and Jekyll and Hyde, but lots of other examples as well over the years. Um, but this show feels quite different to me. Like, how do you, aside from maybe budget, <laughs> set yourself apart from um, from that kind of uh, movement or kind of aesthetic moment that's happening? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it comes... Uh, it comes from my fascination with technology and not my fascination with film. I'm not a filmmaker and I, I, I love film, we all love film, but it's not, it's not me trying to put a film on stage for you, it's actually me trying to create a theatrical moment that exists in the theatre. And so it's a conversation, for me it's always a conversation between how something is live and how you are present in the space as an audience and as performers, and then how it can be presented in on a screen. And so for me, this one's about scale. You know, we get we have these miniatures. I'm also a puppeteer, so I work with puppetry and stuff. Um, and so manipulating these small figurines. Um, so for me, it's much more, never so much a conversation about, uh, look at this film, look at this technology, how can we make film um, on stage? Because film exists and is really great and you can watch it at home. And so for me, it's much more a conversation about choreography, about presence, about puppetry, about how to make something that I wanted to do in a field once um, in my backyard in Vega in, in the theatre. And that's not about just like putting cicadas in the background and having us walk out, but trying to like actually bring to life a scene outdoors on stage. Um, so that's what, I think that's how I set myself apart is it's not about um, large scale, it's actually about small scale, like it's actually about going small to go big, like how do I make it feel for an audience like it's big when it's actually really small and this is a tiny theatre and we can do big <laughs> things in that space. I also love that um, one of the things I think that really sets you apart, I know I kind of joked about the budget of some of those bigger shows, but some of the innovations that you and your team come up with to do things like this, like yeah. um, Sol, um, because you do things that technology wasn't designed to do in a live setting, but you like hacked a Nintendo Wii remote yeah. in order to, to create the technology. It's, it's there. 
Um, yeah, so you click the remote and it takes a little picture and puts it up on the screen. That's how it is stop motion. Uh, the actors are doing it, by the way. So the actors are filming it themselves, um, puppeteering themselves, filming themselves. But yeah, I've uh, made it so a Wii remote controls, they control the computer basically to operate the whole show themselves. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, and it all just comes out of like, oh, I don't have big budgets, I'm still or an up and coming independent theatre maker, so I can't be like, I want the best camera and I want these things. I buy a, the cheapest camera I can find that's nice and use my little laptop and try and make a system that works to make these things feel like large scale, but um, work within these spaces and these budgets. Which is so wonderful, because that's like completely dispirited in this space as well. This is a like 200 euro horse stables that at some yeah. point someone was like, let's just see if we can make a theatre in there. And love yeah. you're just as resourceful. And the, um, I mean, the design, the, all the uh, AstroTurf, which is a horrible material, but I've used AstroTurf for the miniatures, was just on the side of the road one day when I came home. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I'm just going to ask that for um, Sol or for Nick or for Eloise about any of their works. Anything else you'd like to know that we haven't covered yet? So are there going to be actors as well as this one? Oh, yes, yeah. So the actors um, perform themselves as little miniatures. So they have microphones and it's quite an intimate, um, or it sounds like an audio play, but yes, they are present in the space, moving themselves, moving the cameras and creating the whole scene for you, as well as telling you the story through their characters. Um, you really ask a lot. I ask a lot. <laughs> so how many cameras do you have to have and other stuff? Uh, the, most of the show is just shot on one camera. Because um, it's stop motion, it's kind of like we set up a shot, take a picture, talk over the picture for a while, set up another shot, take a picture, it gets faster and faster and kind of develops from there. But um, most of it's just shot on one camera. Uh, another one comes in at the end, but yeah, most of it's just a very, quite an intimate, you're just watching one of the actors it, it, filming. But I, I, I'm not taking, I don't understand these things, it's too yeah. complex. But I can imagine that people are having sort of head cameras or... Oh no, they're just yeah. holding a, a camera. The actors just have to hold them and they just hand it to each other when they have to manipulate themselves. It's that simple. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Different question. Why did you call your play Pony? What's, if it's about you, what, where does Pony come in? That's a great question. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, there's, I mean, there's the obvious sort of idea of, of like a rocking horse or, but, but actually the, the, the real answer is that it's a, based on, there's a song that um, called, it's called Pony and it's by an artist called Genuine. <laughs> and, and it's, and it's, a, it's a, essentially, I would describe this song as like, the anthem, well for me, the anthem <laughs> for every sort of filthy night out that I had in my 20s. <laughs> <laughs> so like, every, every party, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you probably recognise it when you hear it, and it does kind of actually have quite a significant um, part to play in, in, the, in the script, um, we can get the rights. Um, <laughs> get the rights. Um, Unless we don't. Unless you don't hear in the show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, um, for me, it represents a, a time, and, and probably it still is quite an anthem for, <laughs> it, it, for when I, um, you know, like, I guess, have had some, some times in my life that, that maybe uh, this character is possibly moving on from. So that's kind of what it represents. But it's a really good question. Oh, yeah. But then also, it, yeah, it's the beautiful image of like just a, a toy horse or a pony because it's all about, you know, yeah, babies and children and motherhood, yeah. <laughs> yes. Can I ask you a question about India? Hmm. I don't think I'm alone in saying that it's a very beautiful culture. Very graceful. Does that dramatically create a conflict in your play? I don't think so. No, because I mean it's such a diverse place, and um, it's a country filled with contradictions. So you know, as graceful uh, as it is, or as beautiful uh, as it can be, you walk out into the street and you'll experience something that's so graphic and violent. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a country of contradictions, I think. Um, and nothing really makes sense over there, and then so much makes sense. Um, so the play really uh, 
encapsulates all of that chaos, hopefully the beauty and the, the, the madness as well. Um, and the grace, perhaps. Yeah. 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 Is that Justin? Yes. Justin, oh my god. We're joined by Justin Fleming, author of the <laughs> 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 We've got more playwrights for our buck. <laughs> 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 Did that, did that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I saw the uh, picture of Dorian Gray for the, uh, the, the STC production, and uh, just the amazing ability of one person to do an entire play on a relatively modest set. Uh, does that inspire you going forward that uh, you can do a mammoth production on uh, in a relatively small space? Um, yes and no, because that is a really, you're right, it's a very strict, very minimalist production, but also, <coughs> yes and no. I think because the, the, that, that show is like wildly expensive. That was like, that was a huge, huge, huge budget show. Yeah, even yeah, that yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and it should be, it's a blockbuster show, it's mm. glorious, but like they absolutely needed to spend that money, and they should have, because what you've got from it is transformative and brilliant. For me, the thing that I love, and maybe the, the principle that is adaptable from something like that is the idea that you can invoke something so... Uh, you can invoke an entire world with so little, mm. and I think you can do that on almost no money sometimes, which is uh, not only exciting for us, but necessary for us <laughs> <laughs> at, at Griffin as well. And also, I think one of the things that's wonderful and generous about people who come to the stables as well, because everybody knows you're not going to see, like, you know, the most um, ridiculously opulent looking thing on stage. Sometimes you will come in and it will just be a plinth and a chair, like in Prime Glacy, but you will also see some of the most magical, mm -hmm. exceptional theatre that you will see anywhere in Australia or the world, of to using just those objects, which I think is something that will absolutely happen on the stage next year as well. I'm quite confident. Um, there was a question here as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think I found very moving in Golden Blood is the young sister's vision of Australia as a, as a place that she wanted to go to and she could realise her future. And, uh, are you able to, in the places that you've gone in your play, are you able to maybe make comment back to about Australian society or have a different view of it? I mean, it's a bit, it's hard to resist, I suppose. I mean, um, yes? Oh, this is anyway, really, um, oh, definitely. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm commenting on, uh, I guess, the, 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 the toxic masculine culture that is in Australia, and um, uh, that's, I guess, the ordinary world where the, the lead character uh, finds himself in, and then <clears throat> goes on, you know, his, his sexual and tantric adventure, um, and yeah, questions, questions, all of that. Um, so it, it's very much an Australian story. It's set in Sydney. And in Kerala, um, so uh, it, it's it's uh, yeah, very much an Australian story as well as a, an Indian story too. Can I, I was going to ask if because um, also the world, the Australian world, it's in that you talk about that kind of world of masculinity is also part of your own. Like it's the world of rugby, which you kind of grew up in as well, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. which is kind of why the play set in a locker room as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe that. Ah, oh, yeah. I probably should have said that. Um, a locker room slash metaphysical spa. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting that that's kind of the specific world that you like. I don't know, I just find that really interesting about the play that it's um, knowledge that you kind of acquired out of Australia that you bring back to kind of comment on the world that you were very, very familiar with. Mm -hmm. I used to be a rugby league player. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. Um, thank you so much to Sol and to Nick and to Eloise for joining us and sharing their projects. Please give them a round of applause.